It's the final countdown. Na, na, na. Okay, I won't pierce your ears any longer. Can you tell that I wasn't in choir? It really is the final countdown though. We are one week away from our first year teacher support video series. And in case you are new here, it's completely free. I know you're listening today because you want to hear a few more interviewing tips, but before we get into that, I feel like I need to tell you how all of this came to be. And when I say all of this, I mean how I got here, how I became a quote unquote podcaster and started supporting first year teachers. So let's rewind the tapes and let's get back to the fall of 2019. This was the start of my fifth year in the classroom, and I kept telling everyone, year five is my year. Okay, actually, we need to rewind even further. For those of you who don't know, I started teaching fourth grade in 2015 in a rural pre-K through 12 school. I loved every minute of those two years as a fourth grade teacher. However, I kind of knew that I was meant to teach math. When I was in college, I knew I wanted to teach middle school math, but at that point, I was just kind of ready to be done with school for a bit, so I graduated with an elementary education degree and a minor in mathematics. Lucky for me, in North Dakota, the legislation changed, and because of the teacher shortage, they were allowing teachers to teach in their content area. All of this happened right before the start of the school year in 2017. I already had my fourth grade classroom perfected and I was ready for my new group of fourth grade students to come in. But without hesitation, I accepted the proposition of teaching in the middle school. So just like that, I went from being ready to crush my third year as a fourth grade teacher to suddenly teaching seventh grade math, eighth grade pre-algebra, 10th grade geometry, a consumer math class for juniors and seniors, and then a keyboarding and computer applications class. Like what? It was seriously the best experience though that I will never forget. However, that rural school was 22 miles from my house and after four incredible years of doing the commute back and forth every day, I made the hard decision to leave that school district and teach in the town I lived in. Which now, that brings us to the fall of 2019. Although I was new to the school and new to the district, I still knew year five was going to be my year. I'll never forget the feeling that washed over me during my first week teaching there. It was honestly almost spiritual, but it was just this feeling of peace and comfort, yet excitement and anticipation. The school year was going better than I ever imagined. I mean, if I'm being honest, I was sad about not going back to my old school district, so I didn't set super high standards for the year. Regardless, I knew I was right where I was meant to be. That school year was just the start of all of this. This is where all of you come into my story. Things were going so, so, so well for me and I was on top of the world. I wish I could show you pictures right now of just how happy I was during that year of teaching, but there was something that was unsettling. Like majority of America, at some point throughout the evening, you could find me on my phone mindlessly scrolling and I just kept seeing all of these posts from first year teachers during the beginning of that school year. These posts said things like, nobody told me it was going to be this hard. College didn't prepare me for this. I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know how to manage my classroom. How am I supposed to differentiate for 30 kids at one time? Night after night, I read post after post from these first year teachers who were just crying out for help on social media because they had nowhere else to turn. They didn't have a mentor program at that school. They didn't have anyone they felt like they could talk to. They just felt alone. They felt unprepared. They felt like they would never be able to stop treading water. I'm not telling you all of this to scare you. I'm telling you this because it's part of how I got to where I am today, right here, putting myself out into the universe. These posts on social media, you guys, they kept me up at night. For months, I just kept thinking about all of these first year teachers who didn't feel confident in their teaching ability, who didn't have anyone to talk to, and who honestly were just considering quitting after their first year of teaching when they were only a few months in because they just didn't think they could do it anymore. And please keep in mind, this was all pre-COVID, a normal, quote unquote, typical school year. 
As I get into the next part of this story, I do want you to know that I'm a Christian and I know I serve a mighty God who's been writing my story all along. So I do want you to know that a lot of this next part does include my personal spiritual beliefs. So picture this, it's December of 2019. I'm attending a teaching conference in San Francisco. I'm on my way to the airport to fly home. And I told my coworker that we should stop and get a tattoo. I've never gotten a tattoo in my life, but in that moment, I felt compelled to get a small cross tattoo on my wrist. Of course, after getting that tattoo, I just kept looking at it and thinking about it and asking God, what are you trying to tell me? And he just kept saying, trust me, just trust me. So here we are. It's now Christmas break of 2019. I'm at my in-laws doing my morning routine of yoga and my devotional. And I was just stopped in my tracks. I literally felt like God was saying to me, trust my plan, leave the classroom. And you know what's really weird? In 2015, when I became a first year teacher, my mentor teacher asked me where I saw myself in five years. And I kid you not, I said, I'm not sure where I'll see myself in five years, but I don't think I'll be teaching. Why would I have said that as a brand new teacher? I just don't even know. Like, It really must have been a God thing. So I'm listening to God tell me to leave the classroom. Keep in mind, my husband and I are just your average blue collar family. I didn't have a plan B. I didn't have this magical income coming in. We just decided that we'd have to cut back on everything and somehow make do. But it still didn't even make any sense. And somehow, during all of that, I knew just because I was leaving the classroom, didn't mean I was no longer a teacher. That's the most beautiful part of all of this. From teaching primary summer school to fourth grade to middle school math to being a sixth grade teacher, all of that led me here to you, to serve you, to help you, to support you, to make sure that as you're going into your first year of teaching, you feel confident, heard, seen, and supported. So it's now March of 2020, and March was a really heavy month for us. Within one week, my best friend's mom passed away, my husband's grandpa passed away, and I made the hardest decision of my life to not sign my teaching contract. You guys, like it just gives me chills even saying that. I made the choice to leave something that brought me some of the greatest joys of my entire life. And then the very next week, the world shut down. After processing everything that had just happened, I knew what I had to do. I had to make it my life mission to help support first-year teachers. So that's what I did. I started investing in courses and workshops and anything that would help teach me how I could serve teachers just like you. I don't doubt for a second that this isn't my calling, and I don't doubt for a second that teaching wasn't my calling, and I don't doubt for a second that all of this led me to where I am right now. I might have said this last week, but this past year of getting to serve first-year teachers just like you every single day has been more amazing than I can describe. Luckily, though, God still had my back in all of this, and somehow a job as a professional development coordinator landed in my lap, so I do still have an income while getting to serve all of you, which brings me to the last thing I need to share before we get into those interviewing tips today. Beginning in less than one week on March 16th, our completely free first year teacher support video series is starting. A few weeks ago, I sent out an email asking for video topics for the series and you all came through with such amazing suggestions. So of course I have to give the people what they want. And here is the lineup. On March 16th, we're going to kick things off with staying true to who you are as a teacher. This is really going to build up your confidence and help you know what's important to you. On March 17th, we're going to be talking all about building relationships with parents, contacting the parents before the school year, effective parent communication, and making sure the parents stay involved. On the 18th, we're going to be talking about managing your time, which includes time management, self-care, how to get everything done, beating the overwhelm and organizational tips. And then on March 19th, we're going to be talking all about applying for jobs. So those are days one through four of our free first year teacher support series. But then for the big one, the one that everyone's been requesting, 
how to thrive during your first year as a teacher. Now, of course, when people requested this one, they were actually requesting how to survive, but I don't like that word survive. I don't want you to be in survival mode. I want you to thrive as a first year teacher. So that one is going to happen during a live webinar. And during this webinar, since it's live, seats are going to be limited. I'm actually opening up the waiting list today so that you can sign up for your time slot. But what I want you to know is that even though I'm offering four different times for you to watch this webinar, all four of those time slots are covering the exact same thing. I just want to be sure that everyone who's interested in watching and attending the webinar will be able to. So if you're interested in that, head to ndteaching.com slash webinar. It's seriously going to be the best week ever, so hopefully you're already on the waiting list, but if not, you know where to go. Okay, now, after what seems like the longest introduction in the world, let's get into those interviewing tips. Welcome to the North Dakota Teaching Podcast. Whether you're a first-year teacher, veteran teacher, or just a mom trying to gain some new insights, you are right where you are meant to be. Kayla Durkin, founder of the Blossoming Teacher Course, is passionate about helping new teachers blossom into the teacher they were born to be. Kayla wants to help inspire teachers to be their best self, whether that means sharing about personal or professional development, self-care, or the latest and most effective teaching strategies. Through this podcast, you will hear from real teachers sharing their stories about teaching, all with one main goal in mind, to be able to make an impact and help other teachers blossom. And with that, here is your host, Kayla Durkin. Hey, hey, it's me again. For those of you who were on the Facebook Live this past Sunday, oh my gosh, you're awesome. That hour of answering your interviewing questions flew by. Lucky for you, if you have more questions, we'll be right back there again this Sunday at 4 p.m. Central Time having a live Q&A. If you weren't able to join last week, be sure to head to our Facebook page at ndteaching.com slash Facebook so that you can watch the replay. Anyway, let's get into these interviewing tips. Last week, we talked all about making sure that you're interviewing the school just as much as they are interviewing you. Today, we're diving deeper into the interview prep to be sure that you're showing up for your first interview prepared. So here's what I need you to do. I need you to go get a few supplies. First of all, you're going to need a super cute little journal, and if you're a guy, you don't have to call it super cute, but you're still going to need a journal too. You're also going to want an assortment of pens and a large stack of note cards or flashcards or index cards or whatever you call them wherever you live. Obviously, if you're driving or if you're out jogging, I know you can't do this at this very second, but listen to this episode thoroughly, and then when you're done, you can get to work. So this journal has officially became your interviewing journal. Whether you're interviewing for one job or five jobs, whichever interview lands you your dream job, all of this information is going to be just as helpful once you start teaching as it is while you're prepping for your interview. Prepping for interviews is no joke, especially if you want to go into your interview feeling confident and prepared. All of those research papers that you had to do growing up, in addition to, you know, secretly stalking those ex-boyfriends and girlfriends, that's all prepared you for this moment. It's time to cyber stock the schools and districts that you want to teach in. If you're looking for a few schools or districts, no worries. Let's just pick one to focus on right now for simplicity, and then you can always go back and do it for the other schools and districts. The first thing you're going to do is title your first page with the school and the district name. From there, you're going to write down the mission and the vision statement. Now, please know if you're applying at a specific school, you'll need the school's mission and vision statement in addition to their district's mission and vision statement because chances are they're probably different. From there, you're going to start writing down any pertinent information you can find about that school or district. What are their core values? How do they manage behaviors? What assessments do they use? Do they use standard-based grading? Do they follow common core? Do they use state standards? What curriculum do they use? What initiatives do they follow? What are their big rocks? What's important to their district? Have they been in the news for innovative ideas? Are they the leading district in the state? What's their socioeconomic status? What type of population do they serve? I know this already seems like a lot, but by learning this information, you will surely feel more confident going in and you'll also impress the interviewing committee when questions like this naturally come up during your interview. From there, the next part of your journal is going to be acronyms and words that you want to remember. 
MTSS, PLC, RTI, PBIS, SBAC, any acronyms you see on the website or while you're researching are ones that should go into your journal. For words you want to remember, think of those big ticket words all interviewing committees want to hear, differentiation, student-centered, formative and summative assessments, just words that you know you'll want to remember to use when you're answering questions. Up next, you're going to create a page that describes your teaching style. You might have to do some research on your teaching style, but here's just a few of the things that I put on my page. I describe myself as an authoritative teacher. I set firm limits and control for my students, but with that, I also encourage independence. I believe in high achievement motivation. I have a warm and nurturing attitude. I think you get the point. You'll more than likely be able to describe your teaching style, though, if you do some research and really truly find out what your teaching style is. On the next page in your journal, I want you to write in big, bold words, why me? Then just start making a list. Why should the school or district hire you? What sets you apart from the rest? What can you offer that others can't? Are you authentic and passionate? Are you goal-oriented? Is your heart in teaching? Are you hoping to give students a voice and a choice in their education? Why should the interviewing committee choose you over hundreds of thousands of other educators? Okay, there's for sure two more pages I want you to put in your journal. One of them has a lot to do with last week's podcast. I want you to use the next two pages to make a list of what you're looking for and expecting out of the school and the administration at your school. I know the word expecting sounds harsh, but we have to have a standard. Are you looking for a school with professional development opportunities for one that offers one-on-one support? Are you looking for an approachable principal? Are you looking for constructive feedback on a regular basis? What are some non-negotiables for you? For this, there's two questions your interviewing committee might conclude your interview with. They might ask you, what are you hoping for out of this position? Or they might ask you, what are you expecting from us as a school or a district? But they also might end with, what questions do you have? Which leads us to the very last page in your journal. On this page, I want you to list all of the questions you might have about the upcoming opportunity. However, I absolutely do not want you to bring this list to your interview. I want you to think about these things during your interview, but I don't want you to bring them to your interview. If one or two of the questions seems appropriate to ask, that's good. But here's a secret nobody tells you. When they say, what questions do you have for us? They aren't really hoping that you ask a typical question such as, what are the class sizes? Instead, they're hoping for you to ask a deeper question such as, what professional development opportunities will I have at this school? How will you help me grow as an educator? What do you foresee as my biggest challenge in accepting this position? How will my success be monitored? These types of questions are going to show them that you're a go-getter, that you're eager to learn. I totally get that you might have questions such as, what are the class sizes? How many openings are there? How can I follow up? When will the new hires be notified? These are all very valid questions that you might consider asking informally after the interview or perhaps when they call to offer you the job, but please do not ask them question after question after question during your interview. Just keep things lighthearted, professional, and be very open-minded. There are definitely so many more things you should put in your journal. And again, it's your journal, so make it what you need it to be so that you can be successful. If there's any important information that you found along the way, pick a page and put it in there. But for now, we're going to move on to those note cards that I asked you to get. Just when you thought your research was over, psych, you're not done yet. Now it's time to start thinking about those interviewing questions. With your note cards, you're going to find every single teacher interviewing question that you possibly can. You're going to go on blogs and websites and you're going to go through every single question you can possibly find and one by one, you're going to write each of those questions on note cards. I'm not kidding, this is going to take you a ton of time, but it's going to be so worth it. Once you have all of your questions written out, which could possibly be 50 to 100 to maybe even over 100 note cards, you're now going to spend some thoughtful time picking the answers that you want for each of these questions. However, with these answers, I want you to write them in a bulleted list. Notice the word bulleted. I do not want you writing your answers in paragraph form because if in the small chance one of these questions does get asked, I do not want you to have a rehearsed answer. Now, 
Just like you've studied for exams in school, you're going to take your time going through and practicing all of these note cards that you just made one by one. As you're practicing them, sort them into piles. Your piles might be something like, I 100% hit all of my points, that note card's good to go. Your next pile might be, I did okay on this pile, but it needs some work. The next one might be, wow, I really need to revisit my answers and how I want to answer questions like that because this did not go good at all. After you've taken time to rework those questions, to rethink about how you want to answer them, keep practicing them. And then once you feel prepared, once you feel like your answers are as perfect as you can make them without sounding too rehearsed, I want you to find a friend, a parent, a roommate, whoever, and just go through those cards with them. It might not seem like it, but having a mock interview with our friends can be just as intimidating as it is with an actual interviewing committee. If you have time, go through them with a parent and then go through them with a friend and then go through them with your roommate. The more you can practice, the more comfortable you'll get answering questions like that. You're really just going to feel so much more comfortable and confident going into your interview if you feel prepared, if you know which keywords you want to use, and if you feel like you can authentically answer the questions, you really will just feel so much more prepared and ready to take on whatever they throw at you. Now remember, they are certainly not going to ask you all 100 of the questions that you put on your note card, but really they might only ask you one or two or maybe three or four of the ones you practiced. Either way, just having those power words, that vocabulary, the terminology, having all of that at the tip of your tongue is going to take you so much further and it's going to help you be a better educator because you already know all of those things. So I know you now have a ton of work to go do, so I don't want to take up any more of your time, but I want you to remember if you put in the time up front, it's going to pay off in the end. All of the research that you're putting into your journal, these are going to help you when you accept that dream job. You're going to know your school's mission and vision statement. You're going to know what assessments they use. You're going to know the acronyms that they talk about. You're going to be one step ahead of the game. I also want to remind you as you're getting ready for your interviews, it's okay to be nervous. Being nervous just shows how important it really is to you. There are seriously so many more interviewing tips that I wish I could share with you on today's podcast, but obviously we are out of time here. So be sure to tune into our Facebook Live this coming Sunday at 4 p.m. Central Time. We'll be doing a live Q&A for interviewing questions. You'll also want to tune into our video series for sure on March 19th, where we'll be talking about applying for jobs. And again, if you want to save your seat for that webinar, which is all about thriving during your first week of teaching, you can go to ndteaching.com slash webinar. Okie dokie, friends. I just want to wish you the best of luck during your interviews if you have any coming up soon. And I just want you to remember you are right where you are meant to be. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the North Dakota Teaching Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. We really appreciate that effort. Be sure to tune in to the next episode for more teaching tips to make an impact. Until next time.